I am an artist living in beautiful Vermont, USA, and I have a lot of questions. So I engage the minds of the people that I meet, poets, writers, artists. I explore what's inside and share it with you. My name is Ricky McEachern, and I am eager to know. Canal Street Gallery is located in Bellows Falls, Vermont, offering an open space where all creative voices may be heard. I visit quite often and am always impressed with not only the quality of the artwork, but also the interesting people I meet there. I am often excited about the discussions engaged in at Canal Street Gallery. I am pleased to share my conversation with gallery owner and artist, Michael Noyes. I'm here today with Mike Noyes, who is artist owner of Canal Street Art Gallery right here in Bellows Falls. Mike, thanks for being here on the podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, now, we spoke about, so I always do like a pre-interview with everyone, and one of the things that you had said it, that you wanted to make sure that we talked about was the fact that Canal Street Art Gallery is an artist-owned and operated art gallery. Um, I worked at an art gallery in, um, when I lived in Chicago, and I guess it was sort of artist-owned, but what, what is it about that aspect to a gallery that you think makes it different and special? For me, I get to envision and run a gallery with other artists and really, I guess, kind of how an artist would want a gallery run, theoretically. Okay. <laughs> Meaning like the business relationship um, with the artists? Yeah, and how artists are able to approach the gallery, both the artists and I think the, the visitors and the customers, I think it's a pers more personal in a way. That's what I'm trying to do with it. And make people feel comfortable and feel like showing in a gallery is achievable and also buying art, original art is achievable. Okay, good. Now, how many artists are currently associated with the gallery right now? 30. 30, okay. And then do you, so do you do a, um, like a retained set of artists that are your, your artists and then you do shows where people come in and out? Yeah, exactly. Both is really the, the core of it all is the represented artists who have a yearly uh, consignment agreement to have artwork available and to be able to be in solo shows. And then the open call group shows are open to all artists and anybody can, okay. be, can be in just one show and get their artwork seen and appreciated. And also, I think also another thing with an artist run gallery is that I'm not afraid to show more advanced career artists and also emerging artists and also untrained artists, outsider artists. It's, I think, really good for both, for all the artists to be seen next to each other and kind of tells a more complete story of what, what it's like to be an artist, I suppose, too. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> I think that's a good point about having people that are at different phases of their art career or art journey kind of shown together, I think can, can be really interesting. So being a, 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 a gallery that's owned by an artist, I think it's, you're much more open to all types of artists, as you say, as you stated. Did you, what was your situation when you were not running a gallery and you wanted to have your art in galleries? Did you have a difficult, you know, a not so great experience that you were trying to provide a better experience than what you had had? There's this, there's this daunting prospect of breaking into the art world once you have gone through art school. This idea of there's going to be this, you know, crack through and then all of a sudden you'll have representation and it can happen, I suppose, but also I like the idea of, of kind of breaking in from the 
from the side door or the back door a lot better <laughs> personally okay <laughs> and uh and with a group of artists in a way kind of make our own art world now you went to art school and, and you stud what did you study there i studied mainly figure painting figure drawing and figure sculpture and when you were there were you envisioning what i'm going to finish art school and then i'm going to be in in the art world and that was sort of, that was like a daunting thought of how how is this going to happen it was i think uh more of a more of a calculated thought <laughs> like what's how how to uh not just try to go the route of sending portfolios and which I did, and I guess you know I had shows and have had shows and do have shows. I've also often shown in more alternative venues than galleries. Okay, what would an alternative um, venue be? Such as a restaurant or tavern, cafe. Okay. Um, those are typically where I kind of went towards, and it just seemed like more accessible way to boom hey here you go and oftentimes I would sell something or I might get another show out of it so it was kind of this um, I guess I don't like going the, the typical routes so on anything uh, <laughs> on anything <laughs> and uh, <for> so <laughs> the gallery that you've had it's been for six years yep and you obviously your artwork is is there as well yep. um, so the artwork that I've seen of yours did not appear to be figures. It appeared to be mostly landscapes. It was that. It's true. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about figures. Uh, when did that happen? Was that because I mean, in art school, I'm uh, not in art school. In high school, I'm assuming you were doing art and had an interest in art school. You're probably not doing figures in high school. Um, or did you? I did actually. I did some uh, some sculptures. And and we did do some some life drawing. Did you go to public school, or was it uh, private? It was a private, a private school. school. It was a private school. Okay. Yeah. So they had a solid art program. It was, yeah. Oh, and good. And real good opportunities. I did a whole independent study at the Courier Museum of Art my last semester, which turns out I remembered a lot of things I learned back then, like cutting labels and putting them on the wall. <laughs> things <laughs> like um and and I always got to I had art teachers and always experimented with a lot of mediums and I guess didn't take any formal figure drawing classes until college okay um I did a summer program at Pratt yeah in New York in high school and it, it, but took uh, abstract painting and didn't take the figure painting or the figure drawing um, was abstract uh, was that the first time you uh, did abstract work yeah I'd say so was that a big adjustment for you or was that was, did that were you comfortable with that was that hard from going it it was a challenge. I had done a lot of work from observation and painted landscapes um, out plein air and with like one of my art teachers in grammar school, middle school. So I kind of wanted to s just try it, see what it was all about. Abstraction and uh, how, how it happens. And, and what happened? Was it a good experience? It was good. I I found I found out that I liked painting large, oh. and oh, nice. I found out that you could also play around with just the paint and the colors themselves to create depth and optics and and that things like shapes intersecting next to each other actually create the line. Uh huh. Um, as you were to draw, whatever it is. Um, 
And the stuff that you're doing now, the paintings that you're doing now, are those done from observation, the landscapes that I've been seeing? Some of them, the more kind of abstract, I guess, aerial view type, are not done from observation. And I have a series of water that's new, and that's not done from observation, but it's done from having studied water. Yeah. And painted water from observation for a long time. You use a lot of paint. It, it appears. Have that? Have you always done that? And I'm I'm very envious of you because I have a hard time. I feel like I never have enough. I'm always disappointed with the amount of paint that <laughs> I have on the canvas um, for whatever reason. So I'm very envious that you have a lot of paint. Have you always been like that? I had a couple teachers, one in particular, who encouraged paint use in college, and he actually was very intrusive and was known to make people cry. But aside from that, he uh, actually came one day and grabbed my brush out of my hands because I would spend like three hours just setting up my palette and mixing colors and trying to mix all the colors that I thought I was going to use. Which at the time was I thought was and good. This was oil at the time, or yeah. it was oil. Okay. And uh, and I was really learning how to mix colors. And he came with to grab my brush and just dipped it into every glob of color on the on the palette and started painting on the canvas. <laughs> okay. And what did you do? <laughs> and did you cry? I <laughs> uh, I didn't cry. Um, I th said, I don't, you know, I don't remember. I think I reacted kind of all right. I, li I liked how it looked on the canvas. I was like, okay. huh, all right. And then I looked at my palette. I was like, you just screwed up my entire palette. All right. <laughs> but the idea was that you could mix colors with the brush on the canvas. Right, right. And not spend hours with the palette knife mixing colors. But at the same time, you have to kind of know what you're doing with the colors to just go boom, boom, boom. So. Anyway. You, s you said that you started <laughs> painting acrylics at six. Yep. Uh, what were you, how did you get a hold of acrylics at six and what were you painting? And tell me about that. Yeah, I had a, a art teacher, first grade, who, you know, I don't remember if it was her that did uh, private classes or if it was somebody else, but at any rate, she recognized that I was good at art and and uh, recommended to my mom that I should take classes and my mom went for it. So you were taking classes outside of school? Right. So oh. that's where I ended up with the acrylics. Where, where would you take classes at six? Let's see. Like at, a, at an art school? A group class. I want to say it must have been some type of art center. Okay. Sure and you were with remember. adults? It was, it was, uh, no, it was other kids. All right. Uh, you know, maybe like eight or ten kids. And were they um, teaching you color theory and stuff like that, or more, more just more kind of I think how to handle the brush. We we were working for pictures, I think, if I remember. Okay. I, I was into painting ducks at first. Okay. Um, I was into ducks for a while, I think, <laughs> and then I got into fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I was just talking. I work. Uh, I uh, volunteer at Main Street Arts in yeah. Saxons River, and we were talking about. I was talking to somebody about possibly doing a children's art class. So we don't have anything planned. But one of the things that I was saying was, I feel like color theory is something that could be taught to kids. Like they could totally get it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you talk about we. You learn the color wheel. But they don't really talk about how colors, if you add, you know, either if you desaturate a color it, to put something in the back or make it more blue to put it in the background or in shadow. And I think that kids would be mm -hmm. able to s totally understand that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's that sophisticated of an idea. Um, and I feel like when you take a lot of painting classes, they don't teach you that. 
They just sort of observe what you're doing and maybe give you a little bit of guidance, but they don't teach you color theory. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I do. Th I guess I do think I remember learning it pretty early on in, thing in things like that, like being able to see that a shadow has blue or purple in it. Yeah. And then being able to see that, okay, then you mix blue with yellow and you have the green grass, but then also you can make the grass brighter with yellow. Yeah. And then you put yellow next to purple yeah. and all of a sudden you have some action. Yeah, you complementary do colors on the opposite colors on the color wheel. Yeah. You've so been anyway. <laughs> painting, you've been in the, this world of color for like almost your whole life then. Yeah. So that's interesting. How much time have you spent over the years? Um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is a lot of kids spend their time with comic books or um, playing video games. Were you just painting mostly when you were a kid? Like, is that how your brain developed was with paint and drawing? Yeah, I'd say it kind of did. I did spend a lot of time looking at the world too. And, and I never minded being alone. So like, it was actually kind of nice to have like my own little space where I could make a painting and kind of have this control over my little world, I suppose. Um, I did play some video games, but I didn't get much past the first Nintendo, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, what did you do with all the paintings that you were creating? I kept... My mom had... Well, I had a bunch of them at one point. When I started getting... And I got into watercolors quite a bit. My mom would uh, frame them or hang them up or they'd just be in my room, I guess. At one point, pretty early on, I started having shows because so the art teacher that had multiple students would then find a place to show all, you know, kind of like their final piece that everybody wanted to show. So that in started involving framing and matting and I got into putting frames together, metal frames and stuff like that. How big of a part of showing your work is that to the process for you? Um, is it satisfying enough just to create something or is it show, you know, putting it out to the world and have people look at it? How much of a part of that, of the process is it in, in overall satisfaction to you? I think most of it really is just the creation of it. Although I do want to share it and it is it is nice, a nice part of it. It's fascinating to always see what people's interpretations are or impressions or it's often different. They see different things than I do. They're like, oh, I didn't see that. Cool. Do you ever see your <laughs> painting in a, so you see your painting in a new way based on how people give yeah. you feedback on it? Yeah, it used to happen a lot with uh, when I painted trees and dense forest. And to me, it was, it was all just uh, brush strokes and color. And then somebody would, s people would see, you know, they'd see faces or animals or all these types of, uh, which I think everybody's prone to do, mm -hmm. kind of see themselves or see faces and things or figures, figures in the forest. <laughs> I ended up painting trees outside and got back to that when our figure drawing or figure painting class did some uh, f sessions outside in Grant Park. So the whole class dragged our stuff out with the model, not nude, but... Uh, and, and you were painting the trees instead of the model? Yeah, one of the models actually climbed up into the tree. So I ended up painting him in the tree and then ended up painting the trees. And I stayed out until December and never really rejoined the class. Wow, really? 
in real life. And then I painted outside in the woods for probably 15 years. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> Pretty much. Where? I mostly New England. So um, tell me about that. You would pack up your painting stuff and go out for the day? Yeah, yeah. I also ended up having a van, so it was my, my studio on wheels. Well, I did have a few stationary studios along the way, but the van was the main thing for quite a while, so I would able, was able to find places. I'd hike a lot, spend a lot of time really finding the spot, and, and uh, a lot of time mixing colors on my palette, <laughs> despite uh, Dan Gustin's uh, efforts with that in school, but uh, yeah, those that was, that was were it was nice. I spent for, so long that was for sitting how, there. That was for how long? For I think it was probably fifteen years. I guess mainly painting outside. Wow. Yeah, whenever I could. Day, yeah. Okay. Day or um, yeah. It's nice being in the woods alone and mixing colors. Had some animals come real close to me because I'd sit there so long. <laughs> and uh, and I was just so sort of mixing. They didn't even know I was there. That sounds incredible. <laughs> you have to get real focused for a long where, time on something. <laughs> where are all those paintings? They are... I have a few in my studio mostly sold, especially the big ones. Um, I think I only have one large piece, really. Well, I guess two. My mom has a couple. Uh, and I have a couple. Okay. Why do you think it's important for uh, an artist at any level, even if you're just beginning, to, or do you think it's important to have your stuff at a gallery like Canal like your gallery in in showing it to the world um why do you think that's important well it is important to share your artwork it's important i think for the world to have art it would kind of suck without it <laughs> it would just be like a highway with billboards <laughs> not even billboards <laughs> uh -huh. it's just a terrible boring highway <laughs> with all cement and no decoration. It doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> um, that's how I picture it. Be infrastructure. Nothing to look at. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so it is important to share it and I think it's it's a, it's an important part of it because it's also Present, making it presentable, making it somehow, whether it's framed or able to be displayed in some way, it turns out to be a whole nother thing for a, for a lot of people. So then... Meaning it transforms into something when it's in a gallery? Yeah. As opposed to... It's it's putting, putting that... Uh, that extra effort into it to make it framed, hang it on the wall, and then when you put it in, in another space other than your own, especially a well-lit gallery, all of a sudden, you're, it's, wow, that's my, my painting. It looks good. <laughs> it makes a big difference. Not that it's making it look, you know, something that's not good look, look good, it's more that it's changing, it's presenting it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's good for people to see. It's good for artists to learn that. I mean, I learned about framing and all that sort of thing pretty early on. And, uh, and, then, it's, and then it's that, and then it's also the, the chance to that's a big thing for me. I worked at 
uh, fine art workshop in Chicago, and that was their whole, one of my work studies in, in school, was their whole thing was to give artists their first solo show. Okay. And uh, I spent time loading up the slide projector <laughs> so that the gallery on there could look at everybody's portfolios that they sent in, because it was back in the 90s. <laughs> Um, so. Well, good. So what if, um, tell me a little bit about the gallery. Um, how often do you have new artwork? Um, are, how often do you have new shows? Are they monthly? Pretty much monthly. Gallery expanded last year in June and now has two gallery spaces that have current shows, a small space that has solo shows and small group shows represent artists and then the large space has five open call group shows a year okay so between the two they alternate months and just about every month something new and if i w if someone was an artist and they were interested in getting their artwork at the gallery what what's the process for doing that there is a call for entry page on the website and anybody can submit artwork and fill out the artist registration with your contact information and your artist statement a statement about your work in the show so we have something to tell people about <laughs> and uh, the next show is the spring salon mm. the Deadline for submission is February 27th. Okay. I'm not sure when this will be. This will, that will be passed when people are seeing this. Okay. Uh, but In my case, there's the Vermont Summer Group Show. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that would be the third week of May, I think, the deadline. Well, I think that's wonderful that you, that you're providing an opportunity for artists, local artists, to um, get their work out in a, in a beautiful setting. The gallery is beautiful. It's very, very nice. Um, it's right on the canal. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, right on the canal, obviously. And uh, yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's really nice. And that's really um, fantastic that you're providing that opportunity. We're lucky to have a artist-owned gallery in Bellows Falls. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Lucky to be here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me and talking about your background and the gallery. Um, I may have to have you back to talk about all those years of painting out in the woods with the animals. That sounds, mm. I have a lot of questions for that. Uh, about that. That, so that sounds really interesting. I recently nice. watched this uh, documentary called My Life as a Turkey, and it was about this guy who raised turkey uh, turkeys from eggs around no other people, and he became a turkey. And he said all when he was out with the turkeys, all the animals would basically thought he was just an animal. Um, and that's what it reminded me of when you said that. I just pictured you in in the woods painting with all of these yep. you know curious animals sniffing you and seeing who, who is this creature and what is he doing oh, they pretty much ignored me it wasn't that Disney like <laughs> but I got to check them out <laughs> cool cool well thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me yeah you're welcome thanks Rick my name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast.